Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Dickerson, Program Manager at Care Equality. Um, so we have a lot of work groups. You just heard about another one with FIRE. Um, and now we're going to talk improving patient access. So uh, for those of you who have been keeping track at home, that's uh, the patient matching work group. More on that transition later, but there, uh, there was a couple of chats. So um, I wanted to do something a little bit different, mostly because Don said that I could do animations. Um, so we'll talk about, <laughs> that is literally how the conversation went. So we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about kind of a patient uh, journey, right? What we're trying to fix here. I know it's going to be obvious to a lot of you, but again, Don said I could use animations. So uh, current reality is that if you have a patient user that wants their records, they have their preferred PHR, they might only get a response from like one, maybe less, depending on how they go about it. So they get that record in. I know we'll get to that. <laughs> the point of this, that's why you're here. <laughs> um, so they're wondering where the rest of the records are. So of course, they have these other apps that they can use. Um, the counter didn't start also, but by the way. Infinite time. Infinite time. <laughs> That's not great news for all of you. I only have so much material. Um, so um, their response is exactly that, just like me and the timer, but I'll fix that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so how do we fix that? From a care quality perspective, what we could do is try to improve trust by having that patient uh, get go through a credentialing service provider, identify themselves, a, a token is sent from the, the CSP, so we'll use that from here on out because the rest is a mouthful, to go back to that app. They'll send along the request for records along with that secure token. And all of a sudden, because care quality is trust framework at the end of the day, uh, and they have the token, and they're only using verified demographics. Uh, we should turn those reds to green, and uh, we'll talk as a panel about all of that, I'm sure. So um, then all of a sudden, all the medical records are received. I did skip over a really nice animation. Look at it go. It's amazing. Anyway. <laughs> so that's how it should work, or at least that's how we feel it should work. Um, and of course, there's the kind of nitty gritty of it. So what we're really talking about here is adding a step. Uh, that's the fundamental change from this proposal from past proposals. So we're leveraging a CSP uh, to verify a patient to IAL2. Uh, the CSPs are identified by Kantara. Uh, so we're just pointing to their list instead mm -hmm. of doing the vetting ourselves. Um, if, for those of you keeping track at home, this looks really familiar to another IAS sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> but the token is then passed back to the app or what have you that the patient is using. Uh, an XCPD goes out with only the verified demographics. Uh, that's by matter of policy. Along with the secure token, the token will carry those verified demographics within it. The responder can leverage that token if they choose to. It's not required. Um, but they will at least know from a policy standpoint that they have verified demographics. And as far as uh, response requirements, I know that's where a lot of people are going to be most interested. Um, the idea there is we're giving the responders the latitude to define, essentially, where their ceiling is to where they want to start uh, responding. So that's up to a 100% match. And um, that's essentially that approach in a nutshell. Uh, I know there's going to be questions and uh, that, so we're going to definitely leave a little bit more Q&A. And hopefully, I've been speaking for longer than four minutes, but we'll see. Uh, <laughs> so how did we get here? Uh, I did mention that this was the patient matching work group. Uh, we started by discussing um, Elements that organizations collect on, uh, on their patients, what they exchange, uh, all of those demographic questions 
to get a sense of what's being, uh, what's present in the framework that we can use as tools. Uh, eventually, what we came to is don't touch their algorithm. Uh, this what most organizations uh, came to. They had their own way of going about matching that they trust, and uh, they didn't want us necessarily meddling, uh, which is fine, and it gave us a new direction to go to, um, because their principal concern was, how do we know that the person initiating the query is the person that they say they are? How do we have any layer of trust at all in that, other than it being a trust framework, which we get into. Um, so we solved that with the CSP, uh, with the CSP edition. So we also, by a matter of policy, which I mentioned, uh, will verify that, uh, well, they will make sure that they are only asserting verified data. Uh, like I mentioned before, responder discretion for matching. And we also have, uh, we're building out a robust reporting requirement. So if anything goes wrong, uh, we want to make sure that that gets communicated to uh, the responder that uh, something went wrong. And we're also giving an on-ramp for demographic query via FIRE. So importantly, an organization, an implementer can uh, fulfill their responsibility to, to re respond to these via FIRE um, if, they, if they so choose to. Um, we will not complain. We want people on FIRE anyway. Uh, so. That brings us to discussion. Uh, we're going to have a fair amount of discussion, I assume, and I know there's going to be some questions, and this is the creakiest part of the stage I can ever conceive of, so I'm gonna stay off of it. Uh, so, uh, let's start with introductions, which I will try to pull up on my magic computer device now, even though it's been acting really slow. So, we've already, You've already met Jennifer, but she's a big deal, so we're gonna go through this again. <laughs> she's the co-founder and CEO of One Record, which was recently acquired by Milliman. Uh, she's uh, on our board, on the Sequoia board. She's uh, on, on the steering committee, too. She's everywhere, uh, and on two panels back to back, which is a lot to ask. Thank you, I was, a lot, I was the second one, so thanks. Uh, and uh, also plays a role in Commonwealth and uh, the Karen Alliance, too. Uh, we also have Genevieve, um, Senior Director of Interoperability Strategy uh, for Change Healthcare. Uh, let me know if I mess something up. Uh, <laughs> uh, she leads Change Healthcare's Interoperability Strategy for uh, Medical Networks team. Uh, she also previously served as the Principal Deputy National Coordinator and supported the development of uh, information blocking regulation and TEFCA policy. <laughs> she has more answers than I ever will. Uh, <laughs> then Paul, uh, you've had various roles in the past, including former Vice President of Strategy and Business Development for Philips Interoperability Solutions, former CIO for New York uh, eHealth Collaborative, and you now serve as the Executive Director of Commonwealth. So again, people that know a lot more than I do. Um, so the idea here is we're just going to have a chat, um, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. Uh, sound good? Sounds cool. Kind of what we talked about. I don't want to like. You want me to kick it off? <sighs> yes. <laughs> okay. Great. okay. So I'm not going to. This is where I sit. And eat. we're going to stalk first. <laughs> I'm just going to give you a high level overview. Right now, consumers cannot query. Yeah care quality under patient access, individual access services, patient requests, whatever you want to call it, in the document-based query exchange uh, IG. Everything is kind of being shoved over to the fire world, which is like, hey, you want to participate in care quality and you're a patient? Great, you can do fire. But what you just heard me say on the past panel is no one's live on fire in care quality. So problem number one. Problem number two is the problem that exists outside care quality, which is in order for me to get all my records in one place, I have to authenticate against so many different fire servers. So I'm gonna off against 10 different fire servers to aggregate all my records. That's the problem. What we're looking for is a solution for me to be able to query care quality and access the records from across the ecosystem, which is really 
what they're calling for in TEFCA too, the two main purposes of use of treatment and patient access. So what the work groups are trying to do is figure out, well, how do we allow consumers to query under request and what is the, how do we authenticate who they are? Is it an OAuth 2 workflow, which uses an existing set of credentials, or is it using demographics after they've gone through an IAL2 workflow, which is a remote identity proofing event with vendors like Clear, uh, LexisNexis, ID.me, Experian, TransUnion, Persona, blah, 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 blah. So we're at the point where it's like, we cannot say no to patients anymore because we have Cures Act in place, we have information blocking in place, and we have TEFCA, which has clearly named the two uh, first two use cases, and then we'll have further down the line. So we're here to talk about what does patient access look like in care quality. This is my fourth year doing this panel. Oh gosh. <laughs> I didn't personally put her through that. Yeah. Not opinion. each time, at least. Yeah. Good summary. I, the only thing I will say, just to, it's not that patient access isn't allowed by the, the documents, yeah. it's just that a lot of people don't, or a lot of endpoints don't respond to it. A lot or all? Well, we do. And we even do in care it's quality. Small, it's really it's small. small. Yeah. You only have 1,100 oh, responding, so it's not there. I was going to hide behind the chair, but that's that good. Out my way. That was impressive. Gosh. So the recovery Welcome is back. the important part. <laughs> so, like in Commonwealth, we've we adopted patient access about 2016, um, and adopting is you know an interesting term. So we wrote up a thing and said all endpoints will be opted in unless they decide to opt out. And maybe we made the opt-out a little too easy. Uh, so we have about 5% of our population that responds, about four point something. Now, it's actually a relatively big number. If you went to someone and said, can I get 1,200 sites that respond to patient access? Be like, you're, you're the biggest in the country. But they're scattered all over the place. So the likelihood of one individual patient getting a critical mass of their stuff in from their community is very small, even though we have a lot of data points because we don't have a regional focus. It's everywhere. So we have a lot of endpoints. but probably not in effect doing as much as anywhere near we want to do. So, you know, we've been trying to move this ball and the, the care quality proposed solutions with a slight modification that Genevieve and I will maybe argue later better with adult beverages. But for now, um, is very similar to what we've been trying to do. I will say, uh, been doing since 2016, I will say that clearly even that hasn't fully worked. So we need a little bit more and uh, we can't be blind to the fact that there is an asymmetric risk problem when we give data to patients versus giving it in a TPO context. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is in care quality, we really just give the T, even the P and O is hard. Uh, so when you go, if we can't even do that, to covered entities at scale, it's not surprising that we're having some challenges with individual access services, which is now what I'll start calling it because Tefka likes to call it that as opposed to patient access. But it is important, like that what we're getting at here is the finding of all your data, there are every human has a moment where they're gonna to need to get all their data and they're gonna find out they don't have it. And so the, if you go on the Twitterverse and see people argue on this, that you'll see these people get really passionate. Well, everybody should just make sure they get all their fire credentials and blah, 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 blah. The reality is a lot of things you do in life you don't think about until you really need it, right? I don't necessarily track all of my financial stuff until I need a loan for my house. Now all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, I better find all this stuff to get the best rate possible. My credit score isn't, you know, I shouldn't be a 650. I'm supposed to be a 780, 20. What the heck's going on? And now you're cleaning up all your Equifax and trying to figure this stuff out. So healthcare is no different. The second you're diagnosed with cancer, all of a sudden, you got to get all your records. And up until then, you played around. Now, this panel is probably not the right, right example. I have every portal possible. I've corrected lot numbers for COVID shots because they typed it wrong, right? and said, hey, I, don't have, I didn't have an HPV shot because normally 40 some year old males don't get HPV shots. This isn't my record. So I'm that person, but my mother isn't. Now there was my dad when he got diagnosed with cancer. So the, the RLS or the record location and the broad-based care quality approach of, we need to make it easier, right? It's, it's too hard right now, even under fire workflow. I think fire workflow is good, but we should be doing better, a lot better. In my personal example, where I was totally failed is I moved to Georgia from Maryland and I had a doctor who would not see me without my previous doctor's records at all because it was a specialist. And I had never gotten portal access from that previous provider. And I didn't really care about it at the time because I didn't need it. But I wasn't gonna get it living in Georgia and like having them in Maryland. So I literally had to do the old school facts and 
get my record sent. So definitively, and I, I think like you all know where I stand on this because I obviously proposed it as part of TEFCA, is like the, the broadcast ability to find my data no matter where it sits is highly important, especially since COVID because a large portion of our population moved during COVID to different places. So your healthcare data is significantly more scattered now than what it was. So. A lot of HIM departments shut down. I mean, that was, yeah. you had a volume blip, right? We're even seeing like a new trend. So my, you know, we could just blame Dave Castle and Jidden for the reason why I'm on the stage. It's because I came to them <laughs> right and they there. were like, hey, yeah, Hi, Dave. Support, we support Hi, Dave. patient <laughs> access. So I was like, great, we will, invest in all this IHE plumbing, very expensive, very time consuming, and we'll query and then nothing comes back. And they're like, cool, fire's taking off, we'll try this. When we first built one record, we really wanted it to be like, you come in, you put in your demographics, and you search and all your records come back, like pure magic. Right now, we deprioritize that kind of document-based query workflow and we push the users through, you know, here are all the facilities, and okay, you auth one, okay, now auth again, auth again, auth again. It's asking the users to take a lot of steps, that's a lot of clicks, but now we're even seeing what's annoying to me is the migration from one vendor to another. So even though maybe we, the user had authed at uh, one facility that was on EHR vendor number one, but now it's migrated over to EHR vendor number two, like there's just this whole big movement and it would just be so much more, it would be, it would, be, it would reduce the friction if we could just query the same as the treatment use case which also creates an issue, and I'm gonna say this and then we can talk about other things, is my personal belief is the more we don't allow users or patients to query the network under patient access, the more we find new organizations coming in and saying, oh, patient access doesn't work. I'm gonna figure out a workaround, a gray area, and I'm gonna abuse the treatment use case. And this is my biggest pet peeve, and I'm using the stage to spread this, Mm -hmm. is I keep having or people come up to me and be like, look at this app, how did they get the data but you can't get the data? And I'm like, they're probably querying under treatment when they shouldn't have. And I think that's the biggest issue, is it erodes the trust. We already have a law in place that says consumers have to access their data and it's not just specified to fire and we need to figure out how to solve this problem and it stops, starts with authentication and that's where we're at right now. Do you want to talk about some of the positives, though, from the group? Oh, because well, well, I, <laughs> I that was all the first things. Yeah, I knew how. This but yeah, because you've got to pull up. I mean, I did. I was surprised. Like there was fair amount of agreement in the work group around proofing at level two, yeah. and using those verified demographics, right? Mm -hmm. So they're demographics you can trust. I think generally there was fair agreement on those two yeah. things, which then gets you to the broadcast query. Because if I verify that you are who you say you are, and I have your demographics. I shouldn't then have to tell you who my doctor is and what my credit portal credentials are, which side note, no one proofed me to get the portal credentials most likely because they're not hard to get. Um, or you can easily use your loved one's portal credentials to get their data, which is what I do. Um, so, so I do think it was positive that there was a fair amount of agreement in the work group around those two pieces, which I think is more progress than we've had before. And we even had fair agreement on the types of demographics that, so uh, if you dig into the policy, uh, one of the things that we did was constrain what demographics uh, a responder could require is present mm -hmm. and some additional ones that you could allow to be present that could also be verified. The idea there being that you can't have a responder that asks for uh, your fingerprint or your DNA or something like something over the top. They, we wanted to make sure that there's a good constrained known list of demographics that would be verified and must be present in order for this to work. And there was a generally good, there was generally good um, alignment on what those should be and what demographics were present and that they weren't uh, too much of a reach to ask for in most of these transactions. Yeah. Yeah, it might, might be important to, why are we looking for verified demographics? Uh, this was added in, in the work group, just so I know not everybody in this room participated because we had 20, 30 people on the call and there's a lot more people here. So uh, proving you are you is one thing, right? So you go through the former NIST level two, you go through IL two now, whatever, whatever workflow it is, you're clearly you, great. From there, what demographics are you gonna use to do the matching? And the concern was that um, I can prove you're a Paul Wilder, but 
what if I just now took the white pages out and started putting any address that a Paul Wilder lived at and just see if I get a hit? And when you think about doing stuff at scale, you can robot that, right? Just get one person identified and then just start putting every address in the country and see what hits you get. And now you've collected a whole bunch of people's data that you shouldn't have. Because the likelihood of a Paul Wilder with the same birth date somewhere in the country in some address, considering we have millions of them, likely to find something. So we said, no, we're really got to make sure these, these, this address belongs to you. That there's a history that this thing, your name, your birth date, and those addresses are attached. So you take their verified demographics from the IL-2 process and say, oh, you are you. Oh, and they've also confirmed that you've had a bill sent to you at that address or a driver's license, whatever. I can now say that's a trusted address for you. And when you go to a doctor, you hand them address over the, over the desk. It's a different process. They take your insurance card or they take your driver's license or you type it in. It's much slower. When you do things at scale, you can make millions of transactions and start doing bad things. So that's why it's there. Mm -hmm. So we're like, why do we care this much? We don't want people war dialing until they find everything wrong. So you take a person you know who they are, you have their birth date, you have their verified known addresses. This is how we do matching and treatment. We don't have a national identifier. Mm -hmm. We don't use social security numbers on a, on a regular basis and most have blocked it in exchange. That's what we use in treatment. It's ve even more verified than the, than the providers do. What next? What's the next barrier? And there really shouldn't be any. This is, the, this is where we're at. Yeah, this is where we're at. It's not, can we trust the organization, like the third party application that wants to join Care Quality? Can we trust the identity proofing companies that we mentioned and the certification body, Kintera? No. Can we trust the workflows? No. It's this part that Paul just articulated. This is kind of where we're at, is like, this is where it breaks down for organizations who are afraid of that risk of exposing the wrong data to the wrong person through this workflow, which is so frustrating. But it's uh, one of the things we found in the work group, and part of why I kind of uh, flippantly said that it's no one wants us to touch their algorithms. But fundamentally, the, the sense was it was a trust issue, and we needed to address the trust issue. And our solution, while of course there's some problems, like not everyone can get IAL2 verified, that's just a fact. Um, we're hoping that's more of the edge case, but at the same time, that is a thing that is a problem that we will work towards patching in some mm -hmm. way later. Um, and addresses can be different. You can get a verified address. Uh, I'll give you an example. We had a, you know, Stephen Lane sitting up here as well. Uh, we had a fun debate between implementers about who's right on patient matching and how to do algorithms. And, in, in, and I looked at some individual cases, and we both had perfectly good addresses that were different. I give a classic example, Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, exists in a, or street or avenue, exists in a lot of cities. Mm -hmm. MLK isn't wrong, right? So you look at US at or the USA, the standard, I capitalized everything, I turned drive into DR, I put the number in the right place, but the provider entered M space, space L space K, and the identity proofer says Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Those are not the same to a computer. It doesn't know what to do. You both got a verified address. So there are going to be edge cases that are still not going to work, mm -hmm. right? But so what? Like, don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. We can figure out how to standardize beyond what USPS publication was at 28 and what USAD has adopted as a standard. But if you have all that verified stuff and it does match, what's wrong now, right? So we can go through all the edge cases of people who can't get IEL2, find a, a service provider for credentialing the person that can go into a, a, an in-person workflow if you really want to solve that, right? There, there's notaries. There are other ways to go. IL-2 is not the only way. You can get an IL-2 equivalent from meeting them in person, right? That's not, that is fixable. There are some things that we can't, but we can chip away. But the base foundation, if it's there, kind of need to move forward and get this moving because it's our job, right? It's what we should be doing. The, I think it's helpful for folks to know, though, traditional things that are in the algorithm that we did definitively remove from the list mm -hmm. um, were sex and gender, not because we have a problem with those, but because you can't verify those to an IAL2 level because of the various state laws. So it, it's highly variable. And so we tried really hard, uh, social security number also came out. We tried really hard to make sure that it was a list that could actually be verified so that no one can require a demographic that can never, ever, ever be verified and therefore say, I'm not giving you access. 
Um, and then the other piece that I actually think is really, really important, uh, we made sure to include historical address so long as it's verified. Because again, I moved to Georgia. And when I went to my new doctor, uh, not even my Shorescripts med history linked up. So they had zero medication. I'm on like five medications. They had zero medications for me that I had to actually pull up my CVS app and uh -huh. show them. And side note, they prescribed them wrong because I showed them to them from my app and I had to fix that. Um, so people move addresses. So having historical in there, especially for an individual access use case, is super, super important um, to making sure they actually can get all of that data. Yeah, so with uh, the historical address, it's if you can retain that information after the validation has happened, yeah. uh, then you can continue to use it, uh, but you have to get re-verified to get a new address yeah. and start to actively use it. So that's an important component there. So that chain of trust is still continued. And with uh, the sex and gender, it's on the non-required list, if I remember correctly. I believe. No, I think we took it out took altogether. It out, took it out? No. Yeah. Every once in a while, I forget my own Pretty things. Sure <laughs> and that causes a problem. Like yeah. many yeah. implementers yeah, have gonna, gender in their yeah. Yeah, it's so gonna matching be logic. So yeah. you're going to need some adjustments to make yeah. this work. We get that. Uh, but yes, gender is, is not really verifiable. And more and more, you're allowed to opt out of providing a gender. You know, your password could have an X on it. Whether, however you want to identify, you know, go ahead. That's a, that's a, that's happening state in many states as well. So it's becoming less and less of a, and by the way, it only knocks out half the population when you do it. So it's not really doing that much from a, from a matching perspective, but we, re, we have it in there historically for whatever reason. When I think about patient access right now, the ideal workflow, so the ideal workflow would be able to use demographics and query and I don't care if it's, I mean, it's fine if it's in Fire. Like, I use as a Fire API, returns Fire resources. That's fine. You don't need to send me back CCDAs. I can still get CCDAs because they're said via document reference. So I'm going to get CCDAs no matter what. The ideal workflow is doing demographics and then whatever API call. Unless, and I've said this to a couple vendors recently, if you build me an SSO, like a single sign-on across all your sites, I'll probably not get on stage next year. I'll retire. I'll be done. I'll be like, this is good. We're good. This is good for the next five years. Like if we, the, because the problem is, is within each vendor's ecosystem, you still have to authenticate against, and this is outside of care quality. This is in the, under the patient access requirements under Cures Act. If it was like just within Epic, I auth once, I get all my data across all Epic sites. I auth once within Meditech. I auth once in ECW. I auth once in Athena. We would probably complain less on this stage because that would be a lot less clicks a user has to take. But as we're starting to think about Tefka, the Tefka ecosystem, Fire is not the only way consumers have to get their data. Mm -hmm. So we have to solve for this IAL2 workflow. And the thing, Paul allowed me to bring the identity proofing companies to the Commonwealth Alliance, and I put them all on a panel together. That was fun. And what happens when the identity proofing providers also roll out a patient access AP app? You can't question their whole workflow when they own identity plus request and they're querying. Yep. And the argument starts to break down. So I think as you see the applications and the companies mature in, and they're requesting under the purpose of use of patient access, individual access services, there's gonna be more conversations. For the longest time, there's only a couple of companies in the room you know, talking about this. I mean, there's at least like six or seven Mm. Certified by Cantera now, but and if you've not done IL two, I have um, I've done it twice because with two different vendors. It's actually uh, if you have all your information, it takes about five minutes. It's it's actually it's quite a lot of easy. Friction. It's it's friction, but it's like I would say this in our pilot that we did, they surveyed the users afterwards to ask them about the IL two IL two and how they felt, and generally every single one of them was like. It wasn't that fun, but I felt like my data was secure, so I really didn't mind doing it. And I think we only had two people fail out of about 35 that went through, and some of them were just weird things um, that I wouldn't expect on a larger scale. So, so generally, like most consumers, I think, understand, especially in this day and age, the security of their data, and they're not like, how dare you? ask me for a picture of my driver's license. Yeah. Like, I mean, we do that all the, like, I feel like you have to do that just to buy tickets somewhere now. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty common. It's creepy all the time. <laughs>
Uh, one, in, one invasive semi-creepy thing that doing it once versus yes, having to do it 20 part. times is better, right? So yeah, exactly. pick your favorite PHR, consumer app, whatever yeah. version of language you want you to describe it. And go do it. It sends you through that and it works. Is a lot better than finding every fire endpoint, trying to do an online workflow of the yeah. 22 providers you've seen in the history of your life. And again, I go back to the cancer example. I don't know if the data from 17 years ago is important that I can get access to. I don't think it is, but maybe they do, right? Because it's something special in that in that workflow. So, you know, the the scale is better if you only have to do that that invasive pain in the rear thing once, yeah. and to do it 20 times. I also like the thought of this like magical, like oh, as new data comes available and you've already been identity proof, it's going to come in. Um, I mean, there's a lot of value if we're going to do national exchange. You can't exclude the people that you're exchanging the documents about from the network. It's kind of it's not. It would make the patient apps second class citizens. Yeah, we're second class citizens right now. Which is not cool. We're working on things. <laughs> this is a process. We're a community. Uh, speaking of, I, there's some conflicting uh, thoughts on how much time we have left. So I want to make sure that we have some time for Q&A. So uh, we could continue on for a billion years. And we have in our work group. Uh, I've definitely. <laughs> Who has questions? Any questions? Anyone at all? Hey, Zach. Sure. So you're, you're talking about off and how we do this. And the, what it boils down to is the legal responsibility of who would get sued, right? So what's yeah. being done there? <laughs> That's so the bigger part. I was actually yeah, talking to Genevieve about this. I'll yeah. tee it up. I'll let her yeah, answer. Yeah, we were. So to be clear, and I'll channel Devin and Lucia in my comments. Uh, Third-party apps are third-party apps. They are not HIPAA-covered entities or business associates. Once the data is released to them, your HIPAA obligations are over. <laughs> Doesn't mean you can't get sued, as our lawyers have told me, uh, on a, in, a, in a civil lawsuit, right? Um, that being said, like at least on the HIPAA side, the biggest concern that came out of the work group is I have mismatched the patient and I gave the wrong data to the wrong patient or like you know something went weird in the matching and I've given, given up the wrong data. And then I do have a HIPAA issue of in the covered entity and business associate scenario, it's an exception. When it's individual access, it's not an exception and that is considered a breach even if it's one patient, right? That's a very understandable concern. Uh, Ryan is here, I think, back in the back corner hiding from Karen Alliance. Um, they did send a letter to OCR to ask for exceptions. It sounds like we're making some progress there. Um, and so I'm very hopeful, like, from a HIPAA perspective, there'll be exceptions. From a civil lawsuit perspective, um, I would say, and as you can, I'm a change healthcare, we're now with Optum. As you can imagine, our lawyers are hyper, hyper sensitive about lawsuits <laughs> in general. Probably not supposed to say that, but. Um, our lawyer stance tends to be if we can demonstrate that we've done everything we can to make the exchange secure and make sure that we're giving data to the right patients, that even in a lawsuit perspective, like you would demonstrate in a court of law that you followed the rules, right? It doesn't mean you're always going to get out of everything, but I just got to be honest, like we've proofed you to one of the highest levels of proofing available and then used those same demographics to match you to data. I would be really hard put to believe that you would lose in a lawsuit if you're following really strict processes and you can demonstrate you're doing that. Yeah. Doesn't mean you can't, but like, gosh, like what do you want, like blood? I mean, it's just, we, we can't keep down that path, right? Like we certainly don't do that in treatment. I feel like there's a ton of people here who could get sued easily for releasing data under treatment and probably should. But that's like, here's the other issue though, right? Like every third party app who signs on to care quality, and I'm pointing towards Jennifer, but like we're members too, like we go through the same trust agreements, we sign the same contracts. Pay the same money. The entire point of a trust framework is I trust you because we have signed the same legal agreements. And so there might be like civil liabilities, but there are liability provisions within the agreement. So it doesn't mean that you wouldn't share that liability. Also in our terms and conditions, like you can, yeah. we need to do a flow down to our DCCs yeah. for our users. Like, hey. But we do that, yeah. Like, there's ways to mitigate. And FTC will come after you if you break that. Yeah. Like they've demonstrated that. So, so I'm not saying it's not a concern, I just, like it feels a little bit like a straw man with everything we're doing to make sure it's the right patient, honestly. Next question. <laughs> In the back. Oh. You've been on stage too long. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so you, Paul made reference to 
things that may not be, uh, from what I understood, um, like go smoothly. And, and I was curious about an, the, in the process of verified attributes. So what if you can't verify something like even take address, like somebody you're either unhoused or uh, or you have a situation where you live on a tribal territories and you can't really verify a particular address in the normal like USPS, uh, you know, format things like that. What do you do? So, uh, ver very simple, obnoxious answer. I if if we get the eighty percent to work, I'll try. I'll start trying to figure that out. Yeah. Right, because right now it's five percent working, and w what's the point of getting down to details if you can't get the bulk that should work under normal circumstances? So, IL two workflows you talked about. So about six percent, five for you know five and twenty percent will fail. Uh, some will have backup in-person workflows. Okay, there's 20% wiped out. Then we probably have 10, 15% they are gonna have address issues. We're, it's not gonna be perfect, right? Well, right now we're close to zero. I'll take 75% and then start chipping away at what to fix, then to start worrying about the details that'll make us go nowhere. Also, in my workflow, I would just default them. Oh, like, that didn't work? All right, let's try the OAuth workflow. So, like, there is kind of like a, a flow chart for how you can still get people to their data if that's a failure point. And there are at least one vendor, and I won't name them because that feels like favoritism, but at least one of the vendors does have a, have a fallback like video option so yeah. that they can do the proofing like in real time with the fallback in person, actually, if that yeah. fails. It's ID.me. We can name them. They do that. They do. <laughs> yeah. So, I think a couple of them do. So. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, we all in the work group acknowledge that there's going to be some yeah. limitations to any approach we take. And the only thing we can do is hope that it's improving the situation, and then figure out what we need to do to fill the gaps. And if that means another work group in the future, if that means iteration, then that's what it means. Oh, yeah, I know I'm going to drag you into it if I break. More work groups, guys. Yeah. Come More on. Work we work groups. <laughs> time. It will need refinement. If we get the bulk stuff working at scale, we'll have people interested in refining the, the next steps. Yeah. yeah, I would say the only limitation we were unwilling to, at least I was unwilling to accept in the work group was defaulting to portal credentials as the starting option versus oh, yeah. the broadcast. I just, I think, I feel like we should be past that, you know, five years after <laughs> it was proposed. So I think we are out of time. I, I don't think we have any more time for questions. We haven't gotten fully berated, which is nice. Uh, and uh, I will see you all when there is comment period on the proposed uh, policies, because I think that's when we'll see the real questions. <laughs> so, thank you. Bye, everyone, and uh, thank you, panel. <laughs>